Yeah, I'm um, here today to, to speak a little bit about the psychosocial impact um, of pain. And so I wanna speak a little bit about what the definition of pain is and how this may have changed over the past, gosh, 30 to 40 years or so. I'd love to share a biopsychosocial model of pain and then really hone in on the psychology of pain. And then last, I'd love to follow up with some information about interventions for pain and then some resources um, in the event that you're looking for some things that you can try out yourself. So what is pain? Um, I wanna start really by getting a poll and getting your, um, your thoughts on this. So bear with me, let me walk through how this process works. Um, you should see in the very top part of the screen, the um, link that you can go to, it's pollev.com. And when you type that into your phone, um, you will have the option to enter um, the username and the username is, is emilywheat792. And that should give you the opportunity to type in a one or two word response for what pain feels like to you. This will pop up a word cloud. And so for those of you familiar with word clouds, you know that words that are mentioned more frequently are going to show up as bigger and words mentioned less frequently will show up as smaller. So I'll give everyone a moment just to try that out. And I went, let's go back, click too soon. This is great. I'm loving seeing your responses in real time. And if you feel so inclined, you're always welcome to put a couple extra, a couple extra responses. I think this is set up so that you can respond more than once if you'd like. one more moment and then I'll move on to the next slide. This is great. Thank you all for participating. Um, so when we um, define pain, the uh, International Association for the um, Study of Pain uh, initially created a definition in 1979 and have revised this uh, definition more recently in 2020 to the one that you see here um, today. It's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. And I just wanna highlight a couple of pieces of this definition here. One is um, the emotional experience. Um, there's a recognition that pain is not just sensory. Um, and I saw in how you all responded to that word cloud with words like annoying and exhausting that absolutely um, pain has an emotional component to it. Two, there's the recognition that um, pain can come from events that um, may not, uh, actually have tissue damage. And so pain is, is really complex. So there are four different types of pain. Um, and as you all look at this uh, chart, 
which is adapted um, from a um, psycho-oncology book um, about various psychosocial um, interventions, um, you'll see that some of the words that you use are described here. So there's neuropathic pain, um, which is pain from damage or dysfunction of the nervous system. That's typically described as um, a shooting pain or an, a skin sensitivity. And so examples of that might be sciatica or phantom limb syndrome. There's nociceptive pain. Um, that's pain from damage to the body tissue. That can be described as pressure, aching, throbbing. Um, and so things like a fracture, arthritis, joint stiffness um, fall under this category. There's myofascial, and this is pain caused from repeated injury or muscle overuse. So pressure in sensitive parts um, of the muscles can cause pains in parts of the body that appear to be unrelated. Um, so you might feel this um, with something like a muscle strain or inflammation, and you can feel this during um, activity or, or using that, that muscle group. And then there's visceral pain, um, which uh, is pain related to internal organs in the midline or midsection of the body. So internal cramping pain, nausea, vomiting. Um, so something like um, small bowel obstruction might cause this kind of pain. But what about for individuals with bleeding disorders? So um, Michelle Whitcop um, has done a great deal of research along with um, colleagues um, within the um, community on pain for individuals with bleeding disorders. And so the typical words used to describe pain um, are throbbing, aching, sharp, tender, and miserable. Again, <laughs> miserable, an emotion um, is coming up. Uh, when you look at the types of pain that people experience um, with bleeding disorders, 20% uh, report only experiencing acute pain, so that short-term pain um, in the moment. 34% um, indicated that they experienced chronic pain, so that ongoing pain only, and then 32% experienced both acute and chronic pain, with the ankles being the most common point um, for pain. And then the last, um, this research has shown that anxiety, depression, and stress um, increase across each of these four categories, acute only, chronic only, um, both acute and chronic, um, but the highest levels of behavioral health concerns are noted for those who have both acute and chronic pain. So I talked about a biopsychosocial model. This is an example of a biopsychosocial model um, adapted from an article that reviews um, a number of different theories about pain. Um, and when you look at it, you might wonder what on earth is going on here <laughs> because there's so many pieces. Um, I think the bottom line is that pain is really complicated and there are multiple factors to consider. And so I wanna break down each of these um, pieces, the, the bio, the, the, the psych, the social um, for you in the next few slides. But first, I wanna talk a little bit about developmental considerations of pain. So for instance, how might pain as a, a kid or a teen impact functioning later on? And how might um, a, a history of pain impact um, current functioning with pain? And so there's some interesting research on this. Um, in one review by a group of psychologists published this year, um, looking at um, uh, just a, a bunch of different wonderful studies published on youth with pain. Uh, the authors found that um, autonomy, so independence, um, can be linked uh, with um, youth by youth who have pain um, in that youth may feel that they're unable to develop autonomy appropriately um, when they have a medical condition and that it, um, this may impact their ability to build relationships with their peers. Pain has also been shown to have a negative impact on identity development. Um, and one reason for this is perhaps because youth internalize their experiences of isolation and stigma around their medical conditions, and they integrate pain into part of their identities. And then last, pain in youth, um, can have kind of a, a, an interesting impact in general on peer relationships. 
um, youth who have um, chronic pain may interpret social situations differently from their peers. Um, they might benefit from uh, interacting with others who also experience pain that can help really normalize what's going on. And then it may, they may find that they're relying on parents um, so much so that they um, have some difficulty forming good peer relationships. Um, and in general, positive peer relationships for youth with pain are um, really adaptive and support their functioning. When it comes to past pain and how that impacts um, a current experience of pain, there's some interesting research that was done um, in Finland uh, with firefighters who had um, expressed high pain and were followed over um, the course of 13 years. And those firefighters who reported high pain um, also reported high pain 13 years later. And it was found that um, alcohol consumption and sleep problems were associated with this high pain group. So there's some evidence to suggest that past pain can impact current pain. And um, I would say perhaps that's a good argument for finding some ways to, to manage um, and, and deal with that pain um, now. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the bio in biopsychosocial. Um, so sensory receptors in our skin are really what experiences pain and that information is relayed to the spinal cord registered in the brain and then the sensation of pain is experienced. That's how we used to view it, but it's actually not that simple. Sometimes um, pain can be experienced even after the body tissue has healed. Um, pain might even be experienced differently over time and in different locations. Um, even though it's been attributed to the same injury. And then elevated stress levels can lead to elevations in cortisol, and this might create a scenario in which the body is more susceptible to pain. And then there's the role of inflammation too. Um, research has shown um, that uh, inflammation may result um, in pain as well as um, damage to the central nervous system. And then genetics can also play a role in pain and pain susceptibility. So um, there is certainly a, a, a biological component. So let's talk a little bit about the social part in this biopsychosocial um, aspect of pain. So pain doesn't exist in isolation. It's impacted by our social context, our history, our culture, and our social expectations. Likewise, pain can impact how we interact with others. It can impact our work experience um, and our ability to perform important day-to-day -day tasks. So for those of you who thought um, you didn't get the chance to respond to the last poll, here's your opportunity. Um, this should be free text, so you should be able to enter um, a, a, a couple of, like a, a short phrase if you'd like. So how has pain impacted you or impacted someone you care about in the social realm? And again, um, if you didn't get the opportunity to join in on the last um, poll, you'll go to pollev.com and then you'll type in for the username Emily Wheat. 792, and that will give you the opportunity to um, respond. You may have the opportunity to put your name in there. It's okay um, if you want to skip through that um, and, and um, respond anonymously. See that some of you have figured out how to make this work, which is so great. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of responses here about, um, you know, kind of wanting to not, um, uh, not feeling like you want to do the things you typically want to do because you're in pain. Um, 
a shorter fuse. Yeah, feeling irritable. Absolutely. This is great. Thank you all so much for sharing. So now I wanna um, spend a moment talking about the psych piece um, in the biopsychosocial model of pain. And so to do that, I'll talk a little bit about emotions, um, cognitions or thoughts, and then behavior or kind of what we do or maybe what we don't do um, when, we're, when we're feeling or experiencing pain. So um, another poll, what emotions do you associate with pain? These numbers um, or bars will change in real time um, as we get um, more respondents. But I'm seeing that um, mostly um, the experience of this group is anger, sadness, um, fear, and anxiety. So two or more of the above. And I'll tell you that you are um, right in line <laughs> with um, what the research says about um, the emotions we experience when it comes to pain. Um, so I wanna just walk through each of these briefly. Um, so anxiety, um, typically that can show up as fear of pain or anxiety about the meaning of symptoms. Like what, is this, what does this pain mean um, for my body? What's gonna happen? It can be anxiety about an increase in pain. Um, like, is this gonna get worse? Anxiety about what pain will mean for future functioning. Does this pain mean that I can't do, and then you know, fill in the blank. Uh, fear of pain can lead to avoidance behavior. And then fear of movement and re-injury are actually better predictors of um, functional limitations. So like how well you do when it comes to socializing with others or interacting with people you care about or at work. Um, so that fear um, is a better predictor of those functional limitations than biomedical factors. Um, so like the injury itself, um, even a better predictor than pain severity or pain duration. So that anxiety, it's pretty, it's pretty significant. Um, for depression, it's estimated that 40 to 50% of those with chronic pain suffer from depression. And it's thought that there's a bi-directional relationship between depression and pain. So um, pain can lead, lead to depression and depression can lead to pain. So they, they really go hand in hand. And then last, anger has also been noted to be associated with chronic pain. However, because anger is viewed as an undesirable emotion, typically in most social environments, um, it might be that the association between um, anger and pain is underestimated because when something's undesirable, um, we as humans tend to report it a little less. Um, inhibiting anger may increase um, the aversiveness of a chronic pain experience um, and suppressed anger may be a predictor of pain and is associated with great levels of disability and depression. So what about thoughts? So pain and cognition. How does pain kind of change or impact how we think? Because it does, right? Um, so in this first bullet, it mentions appraisal and beliefs. So what are those? So appraisal, that's really the meaning that you give to pain. And then beliefs, pain beliefs are how you interpret that appraisal. So these beliefs develop across the lifetime and inform what you believe um, to be the cause of pain inform what you believe the prognosis of pain is and inform what you believe might be an acceptable treatment. So for example, do you view pain as dangerous and harmful or is it just part of the process? Um, so pain from an injury might be viewed really differently than something like labor pains or pains after a really enjoyable workout that you feel like you really accomplished something, right? Um, beliefs about, um, beliefs that pain is indicative of damage 
um, may mean um, that you are um, feeling less likely to engage in activities. Um, beliefs that pain leads to disability or that pain is uncontrollable or that pain is permanent, those can all be really unhelpful um, thoughts um, when it comes to um, dealing with and managing pain. So the next bullet, catastrophizing. Um, try to say that three times fast <laughs> and you'll always get tongue tied. Um, catastrophizing is an exaggerated negative view of actual or anticipated pain experiences. Um, it's in, associated with increased pain, increased illness behavior and dysfunction both physically and psychologically. Um, so if we, you know, maybe for instance, um, have a headache and catastrophize, we might then um, think, oh no, this headache um, will um, last all day. Um, the last time I had a headache like this, I um, vomited <laughs> or, you know, wasn't able to um, sit in a room with bright lights. I guess I'm going to have to stay, you know, at home and, and, and I won't be able to do things. I'm probably going to get fired. Um, and then no one's going to, and it, it, it can keep going down a train of um, catastrophizing thoughts. And that can be really harmful. Okay. Um, so other thoughts, perceived control and self-efficacy. So perceived control means the degree to which one believes they can influence the duration, frequency, intensity, or unpleasantness of pain. The belief that pain is in your control may lead to viewing pain as less unpleasant or intense and can increase your pain tolerance. Um, the belief that you can control the effects of pain leads to better adjustment and less disability. So that um, idea of perceived control is really important. Self-efficacy is your belief in being able to perform a specific task or a desired outcome. Um, so self-efficacy has a positive impact on an individual's level of pain, psychological adjustment, and ability to function. And then last is vulnerability and resilience. So personality and temperament um, and predisposition to worries about one's medical future are factors that could increase a person's vulnerability to certain types of negative thinking, like the ones that I mentioned earlier. And then optimism, um, the view that a person will experience more good than bad outcomes, um, and hope, um, and benefit finding, which is finding positive aspects of adverse life events, are all potential protective factors. So what about behaviors? How does pain impact um, what we choose to do, how we act? As discussed earlier, and as you all so um, graciously shared um, in some of your uh, responses, pain has been associated with avoidance, inactivity, and isolation, um, perhaps in large part to one's beliefs and thoughts about pain and its predicted outcomes. So I wanna talk a little bit um, about the interventions uh, out there for pain and what um, you know could be or might be helpful. And we'll do a couple of brief activities um, as part of these interventions. So the first is cognitive um, behavioral therapy. Um, this is a structured therapy that combines strategies for altering negative thoughts, um, behavioral strategies that enhance positive functioning and relaxation techniques. And so um, we've, we've discussed um, a little bit of aspects of cognitive behavioral therapy already because we've discussed um, thoughts, we've discussed feelings, and we've discussed behaviors associated with pain. And if you've ever um, had the chance to engage in cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT before, or if you're thinking about doing it in the future, um, you can wow your therapist by saying, you know what the cognitive behavioral triangle is. It's this right here, um, this um, triangle with these bi-directional relationships between thoughts, feelings, and actions. And again, bi-directional just means that um, in this example, um, the way we think can impact how we feel and vice versa. Similarly, the way we think can impact what we do. What we do impacts how we think, and then what we do impact, um, impacts how we feel and vice versa. So these really all go together, and a core part of cognitive behavioral therapy is explaining how um, they go together for, for you um, and uh, what to do about it. 
and typically involves changing the way um, that you think about things or changing the way that you do things to decrease um, negative emotions. So I wanna give you a couple of examples of um, types of thinking that can come up um, when exploring um, cognitive behavioral therapy. So a big part of, of CBT is cognitive education and, and education about the types of thoughts um, that we might have, uh, that all of us have, because we're human, um, and how sometimes those thoughts can be a little inaccurate. Um, they're not absolute truth. So um, one example of a type of thought that we as people tend to have is this overgeneralization. I can never do anything when I'm sick or in pain. Um, I always get caught surfing Amazon when my boss walks by. <laughs> um, so you kind of know that you're doing this overgeneralization when you use words like always or never. And so I already see you all are um, so tech savvy. You've, you've already responded to the poll, but yeah, it sounds like this is familiar or sometimes it's familiar. Um, the recommendation for this type of thinking tends to be to um, identify when you hear those words, always or never, you can kind of ask yourself, wait, is that true? Does this always happen? Um, and try to identify um, alternate words like often or sometimes um, to, to fit in those scenarios. Okay, let's try another one. Mind reading <laughs> is another um, type of thinking trap um, that, that we all fall into at some point in time. Um, so in this example, um, they all, oh, I've got a typo. Um, they all think I'm faking. Um, does that sound familiar? Um, have you all ever found yourself thinking, oh, I, I can tell just by the way this person is looking at me or standing or from previous experience um, that I know what that person's thinking. Looks like sometimes, yeah. Um, when it comes to this type of um, thinking trap, um, one uh, important thing to remind yourself is that we can't, we can't read minds. Um, even I, as a psychologist, <laughs> don't have training in mind reading, um, despite some popular opinions. <laughs> um, so it's um, important when you find yourself thinking that you know um, what others are thinking about you to um, identify that um, and give yourself the opportunity, if, if you're comfortable enough with that person, maybe to explore and ask, um, you, you know I'm not faking, right? Um, or even look for clues to see, um, to, to see if there's an alternate explanation for what's happening. Now, those are just two of several types of thinking traps, but when I get to the resources, I'm really excited to share an app with you that um, will give you the chance in your own time if you'd like to look at a few more. Okay, so um, two other types of therapy are dialectical behavior therapy, or DBT, and acceptance and commitment therapy, or ACT. So these are viewed as the third waves of CBT, meaning they're um, almost like the grandchildren of cognitive behavioral therapy, and they emphasize mindfulness, emotions, acceptance, values, and goals. DBT, I would say, has many different areas of focus, um, but one goal that um, has really been utilized when thinking about the treatment of pain um, is to focus on um, skills related to distress tolerance. Um, with the aim of tolerating and surviving um, the various crises as they come up and accepting life as it is in the moment. An aspect of that is called radical acceptance. <laughs> and this is the complete and total acceptance from deep within of the facts of reality. This is, involves acknowledging that facts are true and letting go of a fight with reality. Um, and I just wanna note that acceptance does not mean approval. And it doesn't mean that um, a person is against changing. So for instance, I can accept my pain, um, but maybe I don't approve of it. Or I can accept my pain, but I may still also wish to change it, right? Um, so ACT aims at altering the purpose of internal activities 
and by doing so, reducing their impact on behavior. Um, that's a little different from what happens in CBT because CBT tries to directly change thoughts and feelings. Um, one example is, to, uh, is, is called an activity uh, or is an activity called creative hopelessness. The aim is to change one's attempts to control pain um, and to uh, have a willingness to experience pain um, in an effort to create a valued or vital life. So when you're trying to control pain, um, instead of focusing on that control, ask yourself, what do I want? Um, sure, maybe you want the pain to, to feel less miserable, but perhaps what you really also want to do is get the chance to go out and about and spend time with those friends or um, go for a walk. You can ask, what have I tried? Um, and then how well has this worked in the short run to alleviate pain and create the vibrant life that I'm really looking for? And asking yourself those questions can really help you center um, on, on what it is you're looking for and, and maybe um, decide if you wanna continue with the course you're going on or maybe it's time to make a change, which is ultimately up to you, right? So I want to do a, a quick activity with you all. It's called Willing Hands, um, and it's a way to accept reality within your body. So the essence of Willing Hands is the position of hands unclenched, palms up, and fingers relaxed, just like what you see here. So I'm going to ask you all to imagine a conflict you had recently, one where you got really angry. And go ahead and put your hands on your thighs in a Willing Hands position, like you see here as you imagine that conflict. I'll give you a second to think about the details of that conflict from the, the willing hands position. Now we're doing this rather quickly here. Um, if this were a session, you'd spend more time and go into more detail. Um, typically, what you would find is that when you practice this exercise um, to its fullest extent, um, you'll find that it's often really difficult to remain angry when you're maintaining this willing hands position. And so some other places um, or other times when you might want to practice willing hands, if this is something you want to adopt, is when you first wake up, if you find you're irritated, when you're sitting, or even lying down um, when you're contemplating a person or an activity that you really despise or even hate, or perhaps when you're feeling angry because of pain. Two other um, interventions are relaxation and distraction. So relaxation aims to reduce the effects of pain and stress on the body. Um, pain and stress can uh, impact you physiologically. They can impact your heart rate. They can make you tense your muscles. Um, they can have your blood vessels um, constrict. There's a lot that happens. And so with relaxation, you're doing various exercises to, to change those um, physiological effects that are occurring. So you might do that with um, by breathing with slow and measured exhales with a progressive focus on parts of the body, um, one at a time, and noticing feelings of warmth and relaxation uh, within each body part. You could do that by contracting and relaxing each of your muscles one at a time. This is called progressive muscle relaxation or PMR, or guided imagery, focusing on a place where you feel really relaxed and safe and comfortable. And there's a ton of different ways to experience relaxation. You can do that with a trained professional. Um, and I'll also, um, I have a couple of uh, resources for that as well. Distraction is another um, method that you can use um, with the aim to keep your attention focused on something other than the pain you're experiencing. So you can do this by um, keeping yours or maybe your, your child's or your loved one's attention focused on an interesting object or activity instead of the pain um, or the fear of pain or the fear of how pain will impact you. So you can do this by um, going places, going to school, going to work, getting out of the house. 
um, those can be distractions. You could read a story, um, spend time on your computer or other tablet, um, playing video or board games, watching TV, writing, listening or playing music, spending time with friends, and the list could probably go on. <laughs> um, I'm sure there's um, plenty of activities that each of you might find to be really um, distracting and positive um, that are unique to you. And last are family interventions. So these are particularly useful for caregivers of youth who are dealing with pain. Um, and these strategies can be useful for families in which an adult is the one really experiencing that pain too, because pain does impact the family. So this includes education about strategies to help a child cope and to use distraction techniques to reduce anxiety. Um, this can include developing a structured behavioral incentive plan to enhance a child's functioning. So maybe you get rewards um, or give your kiddo rewards for uh, you know, doing activities that they may try to avoid when they're hurting. This can include working on family communication about both positive and negative emotions and improving family communication in general. And then it can also include things like support for couples as they co-parent and support each other in coping with a child's illness or with the illness of a spouse or other family member. And you may not want to employ all of these strategies that I've mentioned, right, from family interventions to CBT to distraction, et cetera. Um, but uh, I find that it's helpful to have a list of options so that you can pick what really works best for you. So there are other complementary therapies that exist um, that I won't really go over, but I do think they're important. And I just wanted to note them because they have found, they've been found to um, help to help with pain. So things like acupuncture, massage, um, meditation and mindful awareness, you know, those can, can fit under relaxation at times, um, but are, are separate in their own rights. Um, yoga, art, music, pet therapy, biofeedback, that um, is sort of like doing relaxation plugged up to different devices. So you can really see how your heart rate or your breathing rate um, is changing in real time. It's really cool. Um, and then aroma and um, Reiki therapy. Okay, we're nearing the end. So I want to um, go over a couple of resources. So if you're, you know, just kind of looking on your own and you want to explore some things, um, there's a couple of books um, that might be great from um, like a, a workbook kind of self-help perspective. Um, from the adult side of things, I've got this blue pain management workbook. Um, and, and the author of this is actually the same author as the, the orange one too. It's um, Dr. Rachel Zofnis. Um, the orange workbook is specifically for teens um, and also great, has a number of different activities that you can go through and reflect on, um, really focuses on that CBT side of things, um, and also has a little bit of some of those third wave and um, relaxation type therapies worked in. Another app that I really like is called What's Up. And I wanted to put the picture here because it often gets confused with WhatsApp, <laughs> which is a different one. Um, but this one, What's Up, the one with the um, pink background and the two hands, uh, has a list of, gosh, various activities, but also includes a list of different types of um, thinking traps or cognitive distortions, but really like styles of thinking that um, we all, again, as people fall into. Um, that, that aren't always helpful. And then there are a ton of different mindfulness and meditation apps. Um, one that I really like is Headspace, but there are others. You could do Smiling Mind. Um, I'm blanking on the others, but there's um, a, a few good ones um, to try. And so I would say um, with Headspace, there are um, there is a fee if you want to use the full version, but they do have free content um, and they update that regularly. And I would also say they tend to have um, a number of different um, opportunities to obtain this app at a discount. So um, at times you can find discounts for what medical professionals or teachers 
Um, I believe there are a couple of others out there that are in existence, and I know that they have decreased prices in the midst of the coronavirus um, pandemic because, um, as we may all know, uh, there's been a second wave of mental health concerns following um, this pandemic. Okay. The last part I wanted to just really highlight is how do you find help if you really wanna to talk to someone? And so um, your HTC social worker or other you know, mental health professional there um, is really gonna be, um, I would say an excellent resource. Um, so I would recommend going to that individual um, and asking, asking for some support. Um, you may find that you're able to get a quick intervention then and there or some quick resources then in there. Um, and I think that can really go a long way. I don't know how many of you are familiar with child life, um, but uh, for kiddos, child life um, is a profession that can provide support for medical pr procedures, sometimes even um, infusions, um, port access. And so I, gosh, highly recommend child life as a um, support if that's available to you. There are also online resources, and I put the links here, um, and I'm not sure, Natalia, I'm looking, how much, do I have time to walk through one, or am I running low on time? We're running a little low on time, and I, I did want to just ask if there were any questions, <laughs> just to make sure we offer that, that chance. Perfect. Okay. Um, I'll, look, I'll, I'll do a quick talk about the resources, and then yes, cool. I would love questions if there are any. Um, I put three different online resources. There's psychology today. I would recommend definitely going to your HTC social worker before delving into psychology today on your own. Um, but psychology today is really nice because you can um, look for someone within your zip code who treats, um, you know, a range. Like you, you get to like select the boxes of what you want. Um, you can make sure they take your insurance. Um, you can see if they do in person or remote. So um, you can kind of play around with that and see if someone pops up. Um, BetterHelp uh, does a, a big online quiz for you and then spits out who they think the best fit is going to be. And then, um, and BetterHelp is virtual therapy. Um, Talkspace is also virtual therapy um, and tends to give the opportunity for like text, texting therapy. If, if you're not wanting to, you know, meet with someone for the, the regular, what, 50 minute session um, and some various other packages. And then the last thing I'll say is when you're looking for someone, it's really important just to find the right fit because change is tough <laughs> and um, it's really hard to, to make changes, um, even if you know that ultimately they'll benefit you if you're not doing it with someone that you even just like just a little bit. So I really recommend, um, you know, if you're looking for someone, maybe maybe giving them a 15 minute, um, typically a therapist will offer a 15 minute free phone consultation. And if you find that that feels good, um, perhaps that's a that's a good person to go with. So I'll stop. Um, <laughs> so sorry, I get very excited about this. No, one. this has all been so wonderful. I mean, I think I, I don't know. I could continue to listen to you talk about this for probably another hour. <laughs> it's been wonderful, all of these strategies and the resources that you've shared with us. Thank you so so much. Um, I think it's been incredibly helpful for me. I'm sure for others um, on uh, attending our event today. But I did want to spend just a minute or two just to kind of see if there are any questions out there. Um, if you could please put them into our chat space. Um, I moved we would to the new room. Love to hear. Uh, let's see. Looks like somebody did somebody have a question and might have unmuted. Perhaps not. Okay. Um, if anybody wants to ask some questions into the chat space, that would be lovely. Um, but I had a real quick question for you. So we know that not everybody has access to an HTC um, or maybe even kind of appropriately trained healthcare providers. You know, who should a patient experiencing pain talk to, especially if they're having these sort of psychosocial aspects and they might be appear to be a contributing factor? I think that's a great question. And I think if there's not um, a social worker at an HTC, I would say that their primary hematologist, um, if an HTC in of itself is out of the question, I would say um, your primary care provider um, should be able to um, really be a good start. They may even be able to um, 
prescribe medications if that's um, desired or recommend um, a place where you can go for a community mental health provider. Okay, wonderful, wonderful, thank you. Um, and just any other questions, please do place them into the chat because we're about ready to move into our break um, in just a moment. But one last question, you know, I think you kind of touched about this about teenagers and sort of youth, but you know, is pain mostly seen in adults or you're seeing this also in teenagers? And then how is that kind of different? So I think you sort of spoke about that a little bit earlier, but um, if you could kind of expand upon how that treatment might be different if you're talking about a teenager versus an adult. Yeah, I um, my center is a lifespan center. So I get to see um, pain kind of across the lifespan. I would say that I do typically see pain in adults and less frequently in kiddos. Um, and I would say generally the treatment um, from my perspective is, is the same. Um, it's just for, for kiddos, I might do things um, in a little more um, developmentally appropriate way um, so that it's something they can really connect with and understand. Well, thank you so much. I just want to extend again our thank you for having you um, here and speaking with us and sharing your wealth of expertise and information. Um, it's been amazing and awesome. And so thank you so much.